You're listening to episode 709 of A Very Spatial Podcast, February 19th, 2023. Hello and welcome to A Very Spatial Podcast. I'm Jesse. I'm Sue. I'm Barb. And this is Frank. So we're, there's news this week, but it's not, I don't know, it's weird. There's not the, a the lot only, of news. The only thing that I wanted to highlight, and I need to put it in, in the show notes, is that um, National Geographic put out their photos for 2022, so... Go check those out because they're cool looking. They're always really cool looking. I mean, there have been, I think since the last time we talked, like right after we talked last time, uh, there was a balloon shot down just off our coast. If we had been aware of it, we actually it could have been during the podcast. I think happened. we were talking about it. Yeah, we're in yeah. right about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it later that day that that was all we were doing the podcast. Yeah. So we could have seen it from our house, but not West Virginia. I was going to say one of the things I'm reading through is Pew Research released um, a survey they did about the public's understanding about artificial intelligence in their daily lives. And you can go and you can take their survey and then see how you compare to other people. Um, And it includes location-based AI and things that we're familiar with um, in GIS, but the public might not realize is AI. Um, So I'm, I'm still reading through it and it's, it's been very interesting my, um, my great Karnak moment will be, it says they don't get it. It says they don't get it unless you're someone that uses it like we do in your, your work life. Great That's Karnak right, because this week right. was the, the big bing with the, and, the AI. Embedded but younger thing. people get it. Younger people know more than it's, it's more age related. But yes, Bing and Google, you have the integration of chat GPT into Bing and you had the announcement of Bard for Google, but that's not in the demo stage yet. And you still have to that's sign correct. up for the Bing yes, that is correct. chat GPT. And it's coming to Edge at some point in time. And in theory, once that happens, it will roll out into Office. So the thing that Frank was railing against last time will be able to be smarter than him at some point. Well, that's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty low bar. Um, and it's also rolling out to IE. Oh, wait. No, it isn't because IE is being deleted, which is awesome. I like that. Instead awesome. of deprecated, deleted. Just deleted. <laughs> it's being removed from people's computers, and I'm into it. <laughs> I'm here for it 100%. Kill that product. Yeah, I actually, I'm kind of curious. What I know a lot of Fed users still deal with that at some level, so I'm kind of curious how that's going to. Yes. But that's not my problem. But. I felt a little bad. I had a student with an older laptop that was that was trying to look something up and I looked over and I'm like, is that Internet Explorer? And, and they were quite, they were quite bummed. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah. How are you still using that? <clears throat> how do 90% of web pages work on that? So I don't know what other news is. That's the secret. They never did. Did you try a different browser? That's right. Cause that's the one that you, that's the one you would have on hand. Well, Ar- um, Esri announced ArcGIS Reality, which was, I think, actually maybe the day or the day after we last recorded. So it's been out there for a couple weeks now, but that's kind of cool. I haven't messed with it at all, though. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't checked out anything yet. Uh, I don't think that it's on the education site license because I, I looked and it's not there. Not So it's a, a separate app if you're doing really big data sets. Um, like cities or counties or countries or whatever. Uh, There's a separate app. Uh, There is an extension for ArcGIS Pro, and I haven't checked the extensions in ArcGIS Pro yet. Um, I'm not on a computer that has it on it. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, there's a few different things that it includes, but it's, it's mostly to generate point clouds from imagery from what I can see. So it's kind of an extension of site scan or drone to map but just more. exactly. Yeah. Well, you can see why it may not be in the educational license. Cause I would imagine they're licensing something from somebody to make that happen. So that's almost, that's usually the dividing line between whether it's an educational license or not. Yeah. But I would have thought that since they had, I mean, they have site scan and they have drone to map standard, which are now on the site license and can be accessed. Um, by education users. It's just advanced, which is still pulling from PIX4D's 
capability. So who knows? We'll see how that, that goes long term. But a little curious to see how uh, people begin to utilize it as it becomes available to them. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about data types. So when we're talking about geospatial technologies, there's a, a wealth of data that we can access. But really, whenever it comes down to it, whenever we're utilizing it, it's just a few types of data, right? So we have lots of formats, but those formats represent a few types. Types are mo data models. Data model, data types, yeah. Well, do we want to distinguish between types and models? Because I think we could even do that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, there's basically the classics on the data model, right? There's, well, actually, no, this, I'm, in GIS data, you've got your vectors and your rasters. That's the classic two data models. But, but is that as the data we, model or is that the data type? Well, see, it's... The model is how it's structured, right? The model is how you see the world. So, raster is how you what? Right? Sue says, "Model is how you see the how world." How you see the world, right? In terms of translating it into data that can be stored. Well, now we're getting into you know um, ontology and epidemiology, or, or yeah. epidemiology. <laughs> oh, you got to say GIS. Yeah. You got to say GIS. You can't yeah. be you can't be just basic. Getting over the flu, folks. So, <laughs> is data no? Because that's that's not the term we're talking about. Data models, not modeling. Okay, so I'll, I'll get rid of the ing. And you have to have GIS I, in there. Well, okay, so let's cover the philosophy part of this, right? So what we mean by data model. Well, according to our friends over at Wikipedia, it is a model is a mathematical and digital structure for representing phenomena over the earth. A geographic or geospatial data model. Okay. There's different types of models, such as conceptual modules, models, logical models, and physical models. But you so, skipped right over where it talked about vector and raster right in the beginning. Yeah, but again, it, it's a question because you could, they are models, but they're models in, you have a definition of what makes up that model, but it's also a type. It, never mind. It's a linguistic. It's a yes. Well, it's it. It's yeah. You just have to be clear what you're saying at the time, right? Because you can also have data types as in nominal, ordinal, right? You, I mean, so there are contexts. Do we want to keep going from here? Or do we want to start over? Because I, I, I don't no, know. I don't I, know. I which like thing this. You want. I was, okay. was going to so, say along with what Sue said that something I, I you know talk a lot about is that we do use a lot of terminology. Um, that mean that's the same word that means different things dependent on the context. So you do have to be very clear, but also you have to ask for clarification sometimes um, because we we do tend to um, have the same terms over and over. So you have to go, okay, how is this being used and, and what's the intent here and what's the context surrounding it so that I know what we're talking about. Is it a schema or is it a model? Oh, wait, no, the schema is a model. So... Yeah, we could we could go all day to to continue the <coughs> questions around our our different terms. Yes. But okay, back to where Sue had started to take us before I whacked us off course. Vector and raster. Go ahead. Yeah, because I think that that uh, on the practical level, this is this is probably the, the good starting point because this is something that. In fact, I'm about to do this in my classes. All right, this is the week when we talk about this. Um, so. When we look at the world in these two um, main, not the only ways to look at it, but the two main uh, data models and then become data types with um, different file structures and things. When we look at them, at vector and raster, right, are two different ways of seeing the world. So, and g jump in at any point, right? Uh, the vector is a very discrete way of seeing the world, right? Because we're representing features. We're representing a collection of features and generally in points, lines, and polygons or um, points, arcs, and areas, if you want to go that route as well. Um, and so it's the feature that gets represented, right? Whereas, whereas in the raster, right, it's a continuous surface. So that has a different, a different structure. So anyway, so that's kind of the intro of the two kinds. I just wanted to go to, to Sue where she did say points, lines, and polygons. And then she said, you know, with area, I've, I've noticed there are 
sometimes when people refer to things as points, lines, and area, and it always throws me off my my rhythm because I'm so used to and liking the the poetry of points, lines, polygons, you know. So when I see the points, lines, area, I'm like, what? Oh, it's an info versus map distinction because whenever you're talking about arc info, it was a different set of terminologies back twenty. Actually, it was Five wasn't it? It ago? was nodes. It was nodes, arcs, and area. Yeah. I think, yeah. So the other type, then. Well, the other the other data Sorry, model, model. Uh, is the raster data model, right? And this this sees the world as a continuous surface, and so your data is already there, kind of in a in a generally in a grid, and you have to actually determine the features that are within the data that's continuous across the surface. So so a vector, right, you are creating and turning into data features. So you already can see kind of their discrete boundaries and, and what they are. In a raster situation, uh, you're collecting data or you have data about the surface, the whole surface uh, within your extent. And from that, you have to determine what you're looking at if you want to pull features out of it or, or what you're doing with it. I always kind of think about them in terms of uh, a raster is everything's there. It, it's always there. And it, we know there's stuff there. It's just, we don't necessarily know what the value is. So sometimes we have to interpolate or guess or, you know, whatever it may be. Whereas vector is, and this grows over simplification, but I went out and measured a thing. Uh, and it may not be went out and measured. You could have just clicked on a point on the map or whatever, but I know a thing here and I know a thing here and I know a thing there. And the rest of the stuff I don't know anything about. That's kind of the big dividing line in my head for those two broad data models, philosophically speaking. Yeah, so the continuous where you have data everywhere, the discrete where I have a house here, a house here, and a house here. The areas between the houses don't matter because it's a house layer. Why do I need to have data there? So that's why it's discrete. So those are kind of the two ways of looking data, the discrete and the continuous, the ra the vector and the raster, respectively. Um, and whenever as Sue was kind of alluding to, you know, you have even within that description um, different ways of talking about things. So the node versus point, are you talking about an object or are you talking about a portion of a network? A pixel versus a cell, are you talking about a portion of an, an image or are you talking about a single band raster that you're generating? So it's, it's different um, terms that largely have significant overlaps, but they're very quick to become confusing if you're not sure that something essentially represents the same thing, though in reality it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Yes, but even with this confusingness, this is kind of one of the things that separates out, I think, um, people who are, are comfortable experts in working in geospatial technologies that you, is that you do understand and you not only know how to maybe create that data, but you know what you're looking at when you get it. And I think this is one of the hardest kind of hurdles to get by when people start off, right? The the way we generally train is, you know, you, you kind of jump in with some, some exercises, some lessons that are pretty easy to work with data uh, to perform functions, but you're not necessarily ready yet to get at, you know, kind of the, what would happen if we took away all these instructions and you're ready made downloadable data sets, what would happen if you had to do this on your own? And I think one of the crucial things in understanding both data models or any really any way that we work with data is what are the advantages of the model that you're that you've chosen or that that the data you've received is in and what are the limitations right and so when we take for example vector you have to decide and you can right you can represent a city in all three <laughs> I mean, the line one, you know, you'd have to kind of stretch your imagination a little bit, but you could represent a feature probably in uh, two or more of the types of vector data. But what are the implications of doing that, right? If my city is a point, a single location, right, what can I use it for, right? What do I need to use it for? Does that fit whatever my purpose is? If I'm representing it as an area or if I represent it as a line around the boundary, I certainly can, but that limits what I can do then afterward. And of course... If I represent it as an area, what, you know, what are the implications of that? I always think about a, uh, a gentleman that uh, Barbara and I know quite well that was one of Tim Warner's uh, um, PhD students and a really smart guy. 
Uh, he's a professor now, but he once said to me, uh, in his dissertation was about remote sensing stuff, obviously. So his worldview was raster and he hated arc. So he once said to me, why would you even bother with this point line polygon nonsense? Just convert it all to raster. And I was like, well, you could do that. I mean, there's implications, but for his point of view, that was fine. But I just thought it was kind of funny that, that, you know, you see the world from where you set and from where he sets, there's a data model and then stupid ideas. <laughs> that just was his point of view at the time. Well, I'm not sure that that, that has a continue for some people. <laughs> I, I think there is a good place to point out that we talk about one versus the other, but we can readily switch back and forth. Most of our vector data now especially comes from raster data, and we create rasters during analysis of our point data or our, our vector data. So it's not like it's one or the other within most of our work. Some people might have different perspectives where they just want one, uh, like for cadastral mappers and people who are dealing with um, parcels all day long, they don't they don't do anything other than look at a raster in the background maybe, but they don't care about that raster. They only care about the lines. Um, and the same thing with remote sensing people, you know, they're very much interested in what is that pixel going to tell us? What are the the bands I need to get the classification I want out of it? But then again, we can always convert that classification into a series of polygons. So, yeah. yeah. Well, but I think it it comes back to this, you know, understanding what it is you need, right? And so, it, because I do find there's a lot of misconception, especially with raster. Right, that you'll you'll see people that are looking at it, and the image seems so self evident, and then then they'll say, "Well, you know, I need to do a buffer around this." You get you beginners, right? They'll look at something in a base map or whatever, and like you give them a, a thing. Well, you know, to answer your question, what you probably want is a buffer around that road, right? To see the hundred feet on either side, right? And they're like looking at it, going, "Well, how do I do that?" And then you have to explain that the raster model certainly isn't going to help you with that because. There is nothing inherently in the raster itself that tells you where any features are. You have to perform. There has to be some other intervention, right, to create a discrete feature in which you can perform an analysis like a buffer. So uh, it's interesting to see people kind of initially come to grips with those types of things. And to what Sue's saying, I think this is where the GI science comes in um, versus the, the systems and using the tool which is that critical thinking about knowing what's available and then making those decisions that's based on your knowledge of what you're trying to do. And, you know, in that pyramid um, of GI science, you know, the side of making that selection, but the other half is the, the, the area that you know that you're an expert in, that you can, you're the one that can decide this is why I need this. But if you have only known, you know, a limited use of it, you might keep using it even beyond its um, usability, you know, or applicability to the situation you're trying to find an answer to. So back in the day, whenever we were very first learning GIS, uh, and it was kind of even going away at that point, but there was kind of a go-to to decide what data you should be using. And it was kind of the little mantra of raster is faster. But raster is vaster. <laughs> well, there okay, were, raster is faster, but vector is better. Yeah. But there's a few things with that. Now, of course, we have systems where, you know, we can readily get data down to centimeter level in rasters. So, yeah, it it is not faster anymore, but it's also, depending on what your use case is, potentially better than your vector if your vector is at 1 to 24,000 or, you know, a, a relatively or a scale that's lower in relation to whatever your raster would be. So, you know, back in the day, there were a lot of expectations and sayings that you might still see on the internet now. But in reality, we've changed so much in terms of the data that we collect, data that we share, that it, it is a little bit different. Yeah, and I'm remembering oh, uh, that part of that too is the evolution and, and Frank's probably getting ready to jump in, but uh, the evolution of, of hardware. So if you think that some things just, you know, maybe happen um, parallel and you say, oh, you know, I can display this better. But interestingly, the evolution of, of raster data, 
it's been affected heavily, I think, the evolution of the use of raster data by our better technology, right? Our increasing ability to store things, our ability to process things, because that that whole, um, you know, raster was faster initially because you're basically processing rows and columns, right? So, um, but there would literally existed, what, like a hundred different data types for raster because one of the biggest things they were trying to figure out is how to compress them because they would get so big that most software couldn't do much with them. And so um, I I used to go and get the file types uh, for something like Erdas Imagine or something back in the day and show it to my beginning students and say, you know, here's where they were trying to solve this problem because the rasters would get so gigantic and take so long to run through all of the rows that, you know, it would take forever. But in, you know, in these last few years where just that becomes no longer really an issue when you can have a gigabyte, um, Landsat image that you could watch, you know, look at on a phone. It just, it's just some of those those types of limitations just don't seem to be, you know, kind of they, they don't resonate as much as they once did. Yeah, I mean, I don't even talk about encoding anymore. I kind of dropped yeah. that over a decade ago. Yeah. So, I can think of two weird ways to take this conversation. So I'm trying to decide which way to go first because I don't want to go in both. But um, <clears throat> let's start with the da- extending the data model. I don't know if extending the data model is correct. Um, I think now, and I haven't gone and done the hard legwork to say this is true, but I think now that, uh, we're a bit mired in the general thought of vector, vector versus raster, like there are two data models, it, period. And there are, there are no more data models. That's kind of how I, I, I agree with you. That, that's where I'm going. I don't think that's accurate anymore if it ever was, but it certainly isn't anymore. <clears throat> and I think that's one of the challenges we have in the industry. Um, and to some extent education and to some extent research, but in the industry that we kind of conceptualize the world in these, in the, in the guise of these two data models, A or B pluses and minus for each appropriateness for each. But, you know, we talked about earlier in the news, ArcGIS reality, for example, and, and I don't know all the data that it does because I haven't messed with the product, but I think as we move into things like virtual reality and we move into qualitative uh, data is something we can actually analyze and incorporate into uh, bigger analyses that these two data models are insufficient for GIS and they've grown. And I don't know that we've necessarily as an industry acknowledged that growth as well as we should. I raised my hand and now I'm, I'm questioning if I should have done that because there's, there's three different answers I, I want to give. Is there anybody who wants to jump in first? No, I was just thinking, I was thinking back to what you said earlier, which is, you know, we have this ability to go quickly between the two. So is there really much difference now when we're able to, you know, things have changed so much that it's not even really flipping a switch. It's just sort of panning and zooming quickness of selection. So my response to Frank is is one that is... Um... I think probably where you were going, but I think the example here is creating point clouds, whether we're getting that point cloud from a LIDAR sensor or generating it through processing rasters like reality is going to do, that it's, it's, it's technically a vector, but it's, it's not how we interact with it. We interact with it almost like it's a raster. And a lot of times we just convert it to a raster, but in reality, it's still this this large vector data set. So is it a raster? Is it a vector? Is that kind of what you're, you're talking about? Is that kind of tension and ex- things like that? That's an example of it. But I think what it is is that, that um, what I'm questioning is I think that we have conceptualized the world into vector and raster. And everything that we have, we can classify as either vector or raster. Um. And I think that, and this is getting more into the philosophy side of things, but I think that 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 is limiting us. Yeah, I think that that's essentially artificially distinguishing the world and saying everything in the world is either this or that. And sometimes it's this, but we treat it like that. But I think that we are um, not opening ourselves again as an industry, as a practitioners. I took practitioners, I should say, in practice to the notion that there's more out there that we could be doing and should be doing, in my opinion. And so we have one. 
we have one that is I, I would argue it's a raster but it's not a raster and that's net cdf and it's more about volume of data and that volume can be based on a z of time it can be based on a z of elevation it, it's whatever you need it to be within that cube and we've we've been using these voxel models for well is net cdf really a, a Okay, so maybe we have two, because actually I don't think NetCDF is explicitly voxel, but we also have voxels, and that was actually a big thing at one of the UCs like four years ago, um, some of the mo voxel model options, and I think it was about the same time they were talking about NetCDF, so um, there is some similarity there in how they're processed, but we do have these things. So voxels are basically 3D rasters, so your each pixel has an elevation, and you can stack them as opposed to just on the X, Y axis. You also have then have the Z axis. And again, we've been seeing the use of that for, uh, I mean, there were geologists were heavily using that whenever we started grad school in the late nineties. So, you know, we've had software that can do that for geospatial purposes for a long time. It just doesn't get heavily used because it's just not the way, like Frank's saying, that we've been using it. And then we have NetCDF, which allows for these different arrays of data. So it's not explicitly a voxel, but it's not just X and Y. It allows for other um, dimensions, I believe, as well. I don't use it a lot, so feel free to head over to YouTube. And oh, by the way, we've started uploading to YouTube. So go over to YouTube and leave a comment and <laughs> tell me <laughs> tell me how I'm misunderstanding that CF because I'm just doing this after not having used it for two years. I was going to say, maybe, maybe, um, Frank was going to continue on this, but I would say though that that uh, I think some of it is pragmatic, right? So we don't use maybe some of these um, other data sets because in the situation that we're using it, we don't we don't need that level of information, right? Because it's still the tension, I think, and it's not necessarily a binary, but we often we often make a decision that makes it a binary, whether or not we are looking at a collection of features or a continuous surface, right? And the reality is a continuous surface within which there are features, right? There are elements that we want to discreetly pick out. And so the tension has always been, if you captured the surface, there has to be a separate way to pull out the features, right? That's that's the way we've done it because of the way computers store and retrieve and display data, right? So we're, in the object relational model, yeah. Yes, but even in modifying some of those, right? We've, we've never come up necessarily with a good way um, to just pull, uh, real, you know, pull features out of three-dimensional space. I mean, voxels like that, but even then you have one value per voxel, right? And so it's still to do it well and to do it easily. But a lot of times in practical use, right? If I have a data set of fire hydrants, I don't need them to be voxels, <laughs> right? So it becomes kind of a, as much a practical, pragmatic kind of decision as well. But you could need them to be at one scale, a node, at another scale, that's true. A representation. That's correct. And that's where we could change the way that we're storing the data, but we're not going to go into that. Yeah. Or also getting back to the geology, anyone that might be looking at the fire hydrants, but then looking at the um, underground pipes and that's system. Correct. Yes. What, what what is the bounds of the feature? Right. So so that that's that plays into it. But we kind of perpetuate what we've learned to represent those and. In the initial in the initial generations of of a GIS and any kind of representation, right? We were limited by um, the data models, storage, and retrieval that was available. Well, that's just it, though. We had object oriented databases and object oriented GISs, but not in our not necessarily the software people were using. It was not what gain traction. So you still have small world and I still want to get access to small world again. If you're out there, jesse at veryspatial.com, let me know how to get access to small world. The Betamax of GI? No, it's it is heavily used throughout the elect uh the yeah, when the utilities industry. Yes. yes, when that application became So, but so it's still out there. It's just it's not the dominant object relational database that everybody's used to. And again, it, it makes sense. It came out of Access. It came out of um, Oracle. It came out of eventually Postgres and things like that are, are focused on that object relational model. And so, it, yeah, it's it's there. So, yeah, we do gravitate back to that. And, and a big data 
set that I mentioned earlier that you kind of left out of this was all the qualitative stuff. That's another, a third thing that I would think we could identify of data that we have that has utility and value in a spatial context. However, doesn't necessarily conform at all, I think, to the vector raster uh, uh, view of the universe, right? And I think that to some extent, we struggle a bit incorporating that. I'm thinking of the terrible thing that's going on in East Palestine right now, right? Is that we could represent that tragedy in a lot of ways. A, a point line and polygon is a very good way to, to talk about that. A raster is also an incredibly good way to talk about that. But there's also literally hundreds, if not thousands of stories that also need to be represented. And right now we just use attributes as a mechanism of doing that. But there, there are, I feel like sometimes we get trapped into this point line polygon raster data conceptualizations of space without giving enough thought to are there other ways we can think about this that are a little more holistic. And I'm not saying I have the solution, but again, in the industry side of thing, I, I see this as being, okay, how do I represent this with a point or a line or a polygon? Okay, well, but have you thought about something else? So there's there's issues with our, our data models and our data types that we use. Um, and, and we can see those both from the technical side and from the conceptual um, science side of this. But what other types of, of things are we talking about in terms of data models? So we've talked about point science polygons. We haven't talked about the elephant in the room for vector, which is a vector, but is largely also continuous. Is anybody going to jump in? Nobody's going to talk about tens? Oh. The, no. Everybody forgot about, about tens, two. apparently. I, I, yeah, I, I never did. I honestly kind of I didn't know if it was an them. elephant size. Sorry. I just tens like... So tens, a, a lot of times we use them, we get uh, things like breakpoints and things like that for uh, LiDAR data or other uh, large scale point data. And that's really kind of all we do. We create a surface using these break lines through a 10 and then convert it to a raster. That's really a lot of times so, how I see it used now. So if you're not familiar, if you've not used it, it uh, a 10 is a way to represent surface using. So, so 10 stands for triangulated irregular network. So what it does is it uses first nodes that, that sample the heights, but they're irregular in the sense that it's not over a grid like a, a raster. And then those nodes are connected into triangles. And this is uh, actually kind of useful for uh, rendering large surfaces if done right. And if you look at a lot of video game engines and things, they'll they'll use um, irregular meshes like that to, to do surfaces as well. Uh, and so that's the advantage of it is that you can edit sections of it. So Jesse was talking about break lines to get a better picture rather than the a regular grid of a raster to do elevation, you're stuck with one value per per each grid cell. So the only way to get more detail, more relief is to have more pixels and have them be smaller and closer, you know. In a raster. In a raster. But the tin will allow you to kind of edit things so that you have um, those those features that you need, yeah, can have more detail without affecting areas that say don't change very much. They could be larger triangles. So it makes it just a little bit more efficient in terms of how it stores stuff. So since this whole thing started, I've been sort of quietly chuckling to myself because I saw a video on YouTube that came out a few months ago and toddler was from Switzerland, right? Is that correct? Anyway, there's a professor from who went to where who's from where a toddler is from, and he was out in the woods um, talking about modeling um, uncertainty, and he was basically showing you a Toblerone, you know, that you get in the airport in different places, and talking about how you know modeling and data and all the things we're talking about, and then he wanted to show um, some things that happen when you're you're doing this and how you you have to like, you know think things through sometimes and he sort of fell over a little cliff thing to show that you know when you're modeling uncertainty and you're just filling in these gaps and you're making these decisions that you you know sometimes have to be aware of of the real world and stuff so just in the back of my head everyone's been talking but I've been sort of been chuckling because of that um that video when talking about data and modeling and how hard he worked to try to to show some of these different concepts so in addition to our our tens and and uncertainty within those 
Uh, we also have the recent push to use hexagons. So moving from a traditional square shaped raster pixel and, and moving away from the idea of pixel in general um, to these hexagons, which are essentially gridded, but it's it's not the same. And that, of course, goes back to um, um, German early 1900s, West Flatten, West Virginia. Come on, somebody. You mean Kristaller? Thank you. Yes, Kristaller. <laughs> it was like your clues, not very good. <laughs> like, but I didn't know what you're talking about. I, I was going to say D&D, &D, but you know, that's... Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. hey, yeah, that works, right? Which has its own controversy right now. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we see a lot of use of, of those with Kristaller and the idea of access to um, urban areas and, and resources. But we're seeing it now. Um, I don't know. There's in the last two years, there are a couple of different companies that we've talked about who have created data models that they're pushing um, that are based on on that shape instead of uh, a pixel. Um, and so you can have more of and it. So it is a newer data type where you do have attributes, but you're still connecting to. Um, a representation of the space. So I'm not really sure that gets away from what Frank's concern is. I want to talk about the other elephant in the room, which is uh, we've been talking almost exclusively, I think, from the point of view of users. Um, and we haven't been talking too much about the point of view of clearinghouses, the people have to house this stuff. Um, so typically when we're doing work, we tend to focus on a particular area that we're doing work, whether it be, you know, a town or a neighborhood or a stream or a county or whatever the heck it is, right? And we tend to tap into all these other data sources that are out there that have a much bigger remit. So, for example, my last job, I worked at the West Virginia GIS Technical Center that had the clearinghouse for all of West Virginia's data, GIS data, um, publicly available GIS data. Sometimes decisions about data models are related to just, you know, storing all this stuff takes a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of energy to keep all those servers up and running and all that sort of stuff. So sometimes back to the tens uh, conversation and the points and break lines uh, thing, you know, sometimes it's stored in a particular way because it's just easier if you're doing the entire state or the country or the region or whatever it is that you remit to store it a certain way. So we use it in that form because that's what the place we get it from keeps it in because it's just easier for them, not necessarily because it's the best model for your specific need or use. And that's going to always constrain a bit of our decision making. Well, yeah, I'd like to have it in that, but they don't have it in that. So I'll get it in, you know, a bunch of points or whatever it may be for the particular data that you're talking about. And to just jump in there real quick, it's it's also the standard, right? So for instance, you guys had the LIDAR data and the brake lines and data that was captured in aerial images, but you release it as 10 meter or three meter rasters. Right. So you had other data, but the standard for DEMs at that time, uh, which was what, 15 years ago now? Um, or was it, I don't remember when the 911 data was collected. When was I, it? The 911 data was collected in 2003. So, so it was released. So 20 in, years ago. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it was released in 20, uh, uh, 2005. Yeah. So, but still, um, I mean, you're talking about when DEM was still raster before the 3DEP project had started really. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's standards based as well. Well, even the latest, uh, you know, we have one meter now for, we have, you know, uh, two foot contours for, well, they have two foot contours from the entire state because, because FEMA, after the terrible floods of 2016, paid a lot of money to basically get good data for all of West Virginia, because there was no good up-to-date data for all of West Virginia for dealing with flooding issues. The capability was there to make one foot contours for example, but it just was too big and too slow and it bogged down the server. So you get two foot contours for a particular study. Maybe one foot contour is the difference in the world. That may make all the difference, but two foot's what you get because that's what the vendor in this case, the public clearinghouse can handle reasonably because they're working at a completely different scale than maybe your study is going on. And so a lot of that is your data model is a function of, this is the data I can find. 
that's why I'm doing it this way. Well, and I think a complication to that, right, that that uh, maybe those of us in education GIS have seen since the rise of, of online um, dispensing of data, right, so layers that are online, is the, the misunderstanding of what you can do with those, right? So um, someone might see an online served layer uh, that shows them all the, you know, schools in a county, but then not necessarily understand that in order to serve that over the internet, it's actually... Uh, in many cases, being rasterized. So therefore, it's not the original data set, right? You can see it, but you can't necessarily interact with it. And that can be both because of the way it's being served, but also uh, now, you know, we have uh, increasingly view-only types of data where before, if you got a GIS data set and put it in your your software, you could do certain things with it based on whether or not it was, you know, vector or raster. But, but serving things over the internet uh, for largely viewing purposes has changed a little bit. Uh, how you have to, well, not a little bit, a lot in many cases, how you have to do that. So it adds another wrinkle to it. And I, and I think along with what, Sue, what you're saying, some more wrinkles are um, if you, you know, if it's something where you could contact someone, um, you know, you see it and say, can I contact them to see what else they have? But the the thing that I find frustrating and you, you see something you think that you wanted, and this is tangentially related to what we're talking to, but um things aren't up to date all the time you have to check and see and um this this is just my complaint with some of the the clearing houses is putting dates on on data and um what's available uh, because sometimes things are very old metadata it's important folks yes well and also that's where you run into too if you're going to do something that has a a time component to it is uh, you have to add something that, that we've kind of hinted at, but on a practical, again, pragmatic level, you have to understand file formats, which aren't, they're not data types, they're file formats. I'm going to roll, roll, roll this back real quick. So this is a good place to stop. We've been talking for a while. Um, and I think that maybe uh, we'll have another conversation where we will get into data formats data access, metadata, and different resolutions. And, and, and if you even care about any of that stuff, which is a whole different the whole different area that I wanted to get into also. So I think you're right. There's a lot longer conversation than you had. So we will kind of wrap it up for today in, in our conversation of vector and raster and kind of where that takes us in terms of other formats that are emerging um, and where we're going from here. Well, not where we're going from here, but where we've been at least. Are there any events? I don't think I have any explicitly. West Virginia Association to Geospatial Professionals, May um, 9th and 10th. At Adventures on the Gorge in Lansing, West Virginia, which is right near the New River National Park. Uh, if you're going to be in North Carolina, the NCGIS conference on the 9th or 10th, uh, I'll be there. So feel free to to say hi of march. hopefully i will yeah of march uh hopefully i'll remember to bring a recorder there's one i'm but yeah if you have an event to that you want to share send us an email to podcast at very com. if you'd like to reach us individually i can be reached at sue at very com. i can be reached at frank at very com. i can be reached at barb at very com. And I'm available at kind of spatial and of course if you'd like to find all of our contact information head over to very com slash contact as always, we're the folks from Very Spatial. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.